Hey. We're rolling to In and Out Burger in style. All right, so we're here, In and Out Burger. This was totally not my idea. This was that crazy man's idea. We traveled like 400 feet. <laughs> Who does that, by the way? Who does Who the that? Who the hell does that? What kind of asshole gets an SUV? <laughs> Welcome to Fabled Hunters. I'm Yanji. I'm Saint. And welcome to another episode of Last Month Today. Now, I have nothing against diversity. I have nothing against inclusion. But what the hell does this mean? They went from a buy to a under dumpster fire. Yeah. No! Chris, you bag of Cox. Chris Cox, the CEO of Hasbro. And if you're watching this for MetaZoo, please fuck off. We're not here for MetaZoo. Let's move on to a good card game. All right, so Flesh and Blood. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, Flesh and Blood just held its first uh, ever uh, world championship. Yes, in, it did. In its, uh, I guess, third year of operating organized play, which is quite a quite a big step up from originally just being like a game that was uh, made in New Zealand, only operated in a couple countries, and they started growing up to like, uh, I think like 20 countries after the second year. Yeah, and mm -hmm. now they're at almost 40 countries and word on the street is they're expanding to Japan as well, right? Yeah, I've I've seen, uh, we'll get to that in a second, the, just the culmination of all the events. Uh, we Let's just do like a kind of rundown of everything that happened for anybody who wasn't able to attend. So Wait, wait, before Worlds though, yeah. there was that update from Deloitte, right? Oh, yes. Yes, Legend Story Studios. A big, hearty congratulations to Legend Story Studios. I was able, before, um, between Magic Worlds and Flesh and Blood Worlds, to personally congratulate them face-to-face, -face, some of their key members in Las Vegas. But congratulations again. Congratulations for the community backing the right company, backing the right publisher. Um, as of late October, Legend Story Studios had won the number one position in the fast 50 of Deloitte companies. So the fastest 50 growing companies, they won number one for 2022, but not only that, they were number one in the 22 year history of the award by growing over 6,400%. Yeah, I remember seeing the number, I was like kind of mind blowing. 64 X in three years. And that's because of you guys, the viewers, and the flesh and blood believers, the fab fam, we like to say. I think uh, I remember reading a quote by James White where he said that he hopes that like winning this award kind of puts gaming on the map as being a an tabletop industry. gaming, yeah, again. as being yep. like an industry that's worth uh, supporting. Yeah, on like a I don't know bureaucratic, whatever political, whatever like you know like that. Like the New Zealand government prior to winning this award. Yep. I, I heard that they didn't believe in James. They didn't believe in Legend Story Studios. They didn't believe in the viability of a trading card game. But here they are, the fastest growing company in the history of New Zealand, and they're taking the world by storm. Mm -hmm. So congrats once again. So let's do a quick rundown for everybody who wasn't able to attend Worlds. Thursday, the day before kind of all of the events started, yeah. they hosted a uh, kind of like a welcome banquet at, I think it was this bar called the, shoot, I, I forget the name. Something, it was that's very guild themed. It was yeah. like a guild house. Yeah. And before, oh, no, I think that's what it was called. The guild house. I think it was, called think the it was the guild house. Yeah. Yes. Because it was like a guild house. But even before that, there was the Dynasty World Premiere that was done by myself and Chris Sires, right? Oh, that was yeah. last Thursday as well. Yep. Got over 7,000 views. We wanted to promote Unsealed, uh, Fab Unsealed, but we're also doing a re-release from a different angle with better sound of, of that. Hopefully, the viewers will have watched that by the time they watch this. Um, and then... Uh, Thursday night was the meal, right? Yeah, Thursday night, there's the meal. I actually got there a little bit late. 
Yep. I got I arrived half an hour after they kind of opened the doors, but from what I hear from everybody who was there, the line was very long. Yeah, it in. it wasn't organized that well and even having gotten there before opening, I think I waited in line for about 45 minutes and yeah. the food ran out multiple times despite only being salad and pizza and the sound was not that well done. <laughs> it was I, I've promised not to name certain parties, certain organizers and distributors in this process. Yeah. It was a little embarrassing. Let I, me just I, leave I, it I think that. the choice of venue was just not the right one for an event of that scale. The Guild House or the Worlds? Or the, Guild, the Guild House. Okay. Well, Worlds was another shit show. Well, and uh, let's, let's not get into uh, that. Let's, let's the talk, venue, the venue. Let, let, yeah. World, Worlds itself was the event amazing. Was great, but the event was great. Yes. The, yeah. Let's, let's, we can talk about the venue. We're not just. Uh, flesh and blood shows. Yep. Um, I think that the uh, main topic of the banquet was that James White was there with his usual Q and A session. Yep. And he gave out some kind of hints as well as some uh, updates for things to come uh, in 2023. Absolutely. And it the the acoustics were very terrible within that <laughs> space. Yeah. So I have to give a shout out to Dell at Para 9. He actually, on his channel, he had uh, showed the video, plus he basically typed out word for word every single word that was exchanged in that 45 minute segment. So check out his channel, uh, Para 9, and uh, you can, you know, learn about these updates as well. Hear it from the horse's mouth, so to say. I should, they should really just like mic, mic up James White on the next one and just like record it. Okay. Maybe. That's a great idea. Well, 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 We'll give some feedback on yeah, that. Yeah, next uh, worlds, next worlds. Um, but I heard that there was talks of some figurines. Yes, yes. I'm a huge fan of Weta Workshop because I've been a D&D nerd. I was, you know, huge on uh, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and all those Tolkien works. Uh, Weta, I believe, is the most well-known manufacturer of fantasy and science fiction figurines. Mm -hmm. I also believe that they help produce sets for for Hollywood and you know other other movie production houses and um, they're just very prolific and they finally agreed or maybe they just are beginning this new relationship with a hundred copies of adult prism adult prism figurines I can't imagine anybody who would want one of those hmm <laughs> I don't know I, I don't even know if there are a hundred collectors of this I mean First, nobody plays the game, and then nobody collects it, right? Yeah. Like, who would want a prism anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Not like she's got a bunch of fanboys that, I don't know, fanboy prism, right? <laughs> yeah, but that's honestly very exciting to see kind of uh, the evolution of uh, things that are available on the prize wall, moving from, like, cards to play mats to having, like, like cool collectibles like this. Yeah, yeah, and not only that, I believe that the figurine also comes with a very, an ultra-collectible, double-sided Marvel hero card of Prism as well. So you've got your collectability in the actual figurine, mm. and that's directly linked to the Marvel Cold Foil card. So, yeah. yeah. Wa waifu Prism is the second best waifu. Dorinthia for life. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, that was, like, really cool. And then as well as... I think it was announced, not with a lot of details, but that LSS was going to be doing a collaboration with the professor from TCC. Tolarian Community College. Yep. Brian, the professor himself. It's strange. We haven't gotten an episode with him yet. I, I really... Professor doesn't watch any of our content, I don't think, but he's seen us by face. Yeah. I hope we get to do a collab one day. But more importantly, the professor collab... I think the professor has always had a heart of bringing people and introducing people to new things within Magic the Gathering historically, but because of what's been happening and all the drama, I think he's branching out to um, Yu-Gi-Oh! He's been yeah, working he's with, some with the skit guys, with the, the APS, APS, and then he's also doing a collaboration with uh, Legend Story Studios. Well, one of his most successful Flesh and Blood related videos, he did an intro, like Learn How to Play. And yeah. I, heard from a lot of people uh i don't want to don't quote me on this uh because i'm not 100 percent sure but i do believe and we'll cover this a little bit later that 
Michael Hamilton first started playing the game when he watched the professor learn how to play flesh and blood video really yeah really wow so okay we'll have to check with uh the goat and uh see what he said but i I believe that he's only been playing for a few months i i was uh in contact with the goat a couple days ago as a matter of fact so yeah and it would be great if somehow with the collaboration between flesh and blood and the talarian professor that they found a way to bring even more players into flesh and blood because the magic community is probably at its lowest point mm-hmm. and the players are in their time of need. So I have met uh, these last couple of weeks, particularly there's been a lot of people I think that I've met who are just like starting to get into flesh and blood mm-hmm. uh, who are magic converts. They're unhappy with kind of the state of the game as it is right now. Took them long enough. <laughs> well, better late than never. I agree. And, 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 you know, honestly, like, even now, I still think it's quite early in the life cycle for Flesh and Blood. So maybe they are getting in early. It's still the end of OP year one. Yeah. Worldwide OP year one. Yeah. So I, I think that the main, um, the main kind of feedback uh, that I've been getting is that they all really enjoy the game. As soon as they start playing Flesh and Blood, they really enjoy it. But it does kind of suck, like, if your entry point is to just start playing armories against these, like, very experienced players with all these kind of, like, fully built-out decks. Yep. It's, you know, it's it's hard to get into it. And, and I've talked to players who, like, le- legit, like, they play the game and they don't win their first game of Flesh and Blood until, like, they're a month in. Really? And so they're playing for a month. And wow. they finally win their first game. And it's, like, a great feeling for them when they finally do win. But, I can't, mean, like... Can't somebody just stick them with, like, a Fi deck or something and they should be okay? <laughs> I mean, you still... you still, But you gotta, like, you gotta invest. You gotta get, like, the pieces. And I, Oh, okay. And, and I think that's just what it is. I think you and I both started uh, Magic by, like, buying, like, a couple of starter decks. And I'm sure, like, you can't just, like, go into, like, a store and, like, enter a tournament and win with starter decks. But there's just, like, a way to play. Yeah. Okay, there, there, there's definitely a meta. And, I mean, you're right. But back in the days, we had fewer entertainment options. We had fewer distractions. Yeah. Like, you talk about buying starter decks. I bought, like, revised starter decks. And I was like, oh, I'm going to beef up my power level. I'm going to supplement my revised starter deck with Fallen Empires. Yes! And that was that, not that, that was not great. It didn't I, turn out too well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think just like I think uh, classic battles, Dorinthia versus Reinar is a step in the right direction. Uh, but just I think that's like one aspect of Flesh and Blood that you I gave thought, it a B minus. I gave it a B plus, right during our product review. Yeah, I think it was just like the, uh, based off of the price. Okay, <clears throat> I think uh, if it was like a twenty dollar thing, I would have given it like an A. But. The market value settled to about $25 towards the end, right? Yeah. And and even that one card, <coughs> I think that one card is 90 to sometimes even over 100% of the value of the, the set, right? Yeah. The glistening steel blade, that has viability. It's got, com- it's competitive. It's meta, right? Yeah. And I think the only other uh, thing, I think entry point for most people, they make like the blitz decks that you can buy. Yep. But I think that... I read something that somebody wrote, which I find to be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And they said that basically Flesh and Blood, the best parts of Flesh and Blood, like the gameplay wise, the best parts is when you play CC, uh, Classic Constructed, Mm -hmm. as a format. That's kind of, I think, the main format that the game designers are balancing around. So it just gives you like the most, I guess, like Flesh and Blood experience. Oh, Okay. And they felt like, if that's the case, then it feels kind of strange that your introduction for newer players is to give them the Blitz experience. Okay. And, and can, that, you, can you explain further? Yeah, it's just like, I think, for example, if you were to make like a, if you were to buy like a starter deck, and it was just like a starter CC deck, okay. kind of like what they did for Welcome to Wraith. Yep. Uh, that you could get players playing uh flesh and blood uh the way that they're kind of designing around and i mean there's obviously pros and cons i think it's easier to get people easier 
to uh, learn fewer how to cards, play. Yeah. right? Yeah, to learn how to Faster. play Blitz. But I do think that overall, the majority of players that I've talked to have more enjoyment when they play CC. Okay. So, so are you, you, you crossing your fingers and hoping that the professor's product is a CC-adjacent product instead of Blitz-adjacent? Yeah, or like whatever. I I'm not really sure like what they're gonna what they're gonna do, but I think whatever they do, if like you said, if it's like a a, a an introduction, uh, point or or something like that, like whatever they choose to work on with the professor, I hope that it's something that will get just get people excited about playing more games of Flesh and Blood. Absolutely, and I would say that, especially given the mission statement of Flesh and Blood. It's about bringing people together to play great games. Yeah. So this is not; these are not sleeves. This is not a binder. This is not a deck box like the yeah. professor's done before. This is definitely a card set of some sort, okay. in my opinion. So yeah. okay, so I'm yeah, I'm excited to see what's going to come out of that. During the during the week, there were several tournaments hosted at San Jose. Okay. Let's talk about the venue. The venue was not optimal. It was not optimal, and <laughs> I heard from... That's to put it lightly. Yes, it's very lightly, because uh, I heard from LSS uh, executives yeah. that they were bait and switched. They were promised a nice, you know, state-of-the-art venue, and there was, there was, instead, they were in, like... We're relegated like a... to the guest house of the guest house we're... of the convention center, right, right. which is like a big top tent, yeah, we're and like there was like a... a wind tunnel, and there weren't even bathrooms. We're... For Christ's sake, we're... what the hell was going on? We're in like a, like, it looks like a circus tent. That's literally what yeah. it was, like a blue and white circus tent. And then on the outside, they have this like kind of like built up like enclosure that's just like a souped up porta potty. Yes, it was a fancy porta potty that had probably I don't know recycled water, no actual flowing water, just like bottles of recycled tap water or something like that to wash your hands in. It just felt very very unsanitary the whole experience. I I think that. You know, it's funny that you say this because I actually heard from one of my friends who had been to a, I think it was a GP that was held in San Jose mm -hmm. uh, prior to the pandemic. And I think they held it in the same venue. And so it's just like, it's like one of those things where like, you know, this venue sucks. Yes, it's, it's a notoriously bad venue. And um, again, according to LSS executives they were told it would not be there and they were you know given a false bill like you said what's your saying keep your receipts right yeah keep keep your receipts <laughs> uh i i think we can be critical of of the the planning uh the organizer the tournament organizers i think to have well just not been doing a great job well i mean did you join the calling do you remember the calling yeah the first rounds of the calling they first were like, oh, the calling's ready, everybody. They posted up the names. And then literally 40% of the people were like, we're not on this list. What the hell is going on? You, do you remember that? Yeah. So they, they, they anybody did. that bought the gold package within like the last 48 hours yeah. was not included. Yeah. And then they, they tried to sort it out. They had a bunch of people who actually did, did not attend and mm -hmm. so normally they go through and then the players meeting they like figure out who's not there mm -hmm. they print it out like names but Some, the first and last name and the gem id were all mixed yeah, up so, sometimes it's your first name sometimes it's your last name like is the only thing that gets printed and I, then it, there not, were two false starts on that calling event yeah, and there are more people sure. in the calling than the worlds i'm not even sure like how this even happens but like Whatever the case is... It was a monumental fuck-up is what the case was, but... Yeah. It wasn't LSS's fault, It you know, it was the tournament organizers, and I'm, I'm just reporting it. I'm, You know, we would be very biased if we kept that info out of this episode, because it really happened! It was in complete incompetence! Yeah, I think, uh, 
So the organizers of the event, it was Channel 5, it's CFB Events. Oh. Oh, yeah. And, that's, uh, that's correct. I, I'm not proactively saying anything bad about them. No, so no it's that, just, I... I y- y- Yenji said it, not, yeah. not this guy. So I, I, think, I think it's just that we have experienced just, like, overall, like, a, like a negative experience. I think when you compare, if, if you don't have, like, a frame of reference, I think, for example, like, Tournament Center, uh, what they did in Lille, just overall, I think, was much better, like, like, better organized, better venue as a whole. Yeah. When I went to Callings in uh, other countries, like, I think across the board, just, like, the the level that these events are run at i'm trying to i'm trying to find the the right words to say i don't want to be too too mean i think i think that cfb has run enough events in the past that they should have avoided these problems okay that that's all that i'll say i believe that they are in the twilight of their business and they've already exited their most significant positions yeah. given the recent transactions with TCG player and then with eBay they are just waiting for the time to expire so that they can collect their big checks yeah and this is you know this is the morale level of things the or their lack thereof of morale within their management is shining right through mm-hmm. because i believe that the Organized play with Legend Story Studios between LSS and Card Shop Live slash CFB, it came to a conclusion as of Worlds. Okay. And if they had any pride in their work, they would have done a good job, but apparently they do not. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Let, let's talk about the good stuff in Worlds, though. Yeah. There was a lot of great experiences, right? I... Uh, do you want to talk about the tournament or, or any other? All of it. Yeah. Any, yeah. So in the tournament, uh, Worlds was a three-day long event culminating. We crowned our first world champion. Heck yeah. Michael Hamilton. USA. 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 Yep. I've been a big proponent of US Flesh and Blood for a long time. Yep. And it's sad that it couldn't be my teammate, Dan Orkowski. He was up there though, wasn't he in top yeah. four? He was second in, in after Swiss standings. Yep. Uh, got just like insanely high rolled in top four, but credit Oof. to Chris Yali, who was uh oh who made it to finals. Yeah, who made it to against finals against Michael Hamilton. The like, goat. Uh, no, no knock against Chris. Like he played a great deck. Um, but I think that overall, US had a really strong showing. Uh, at the very beginning of the event, they had a uh, kind of flag procession. Oh, that was great! It was a classy experience. Yeah. yeah. So they had uh, representatives from all of the countries. There were 28 representing countries, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and so who who better to win the tournament than the U.S. representative? Heck yeah. Michael Hamilton. The GOAT. So that's two callings. Yep. One nationals. Yep. And worlds. Yep. So as of this moment, I do not think... I mean, sorry, uh, Tarek uh, Patel, and sorry, my friends. uh, He and... uh, Matt Rogers and Nick Butcher, less of a friend, but he he's still part of that team. <laughs> and their new new entrant, you you said Isaac Crute, in your opinion, was the best player in the world, right? Now, Isaac Isaac is really strong, but I think overall the it's undisputed as of this moment that Michael Hamilton is yeah, the goat. Yeah, I think right? in the entire in the entirety of the preparation. I think I think for now, for now, I, I think I think there can be updates to come. Okay, well. I was told, because I, I didn't have time to watch, I, I haven't even caught up on my own Flesh and Blood content, but I was told that there was a match where Michael Hamilton just showed his mastery by letting the opponent Icelander player uh, l- arsenal lock a, oh attack, a defense reaction in their arsenal the whole time. So the opponent was basically like fighting with one hand tied behind their back because he had that read which was the correct read, right? Uh, it, it wasn't so much of a read. I think it was a mistake on the opponent's part for sure. So the situation it was Michael Hamilton. Uh, they're playing an Icelander mirror. So Icelander traditionally is just a, a hero that, that slings a lot of uh, arcane damage, magic spells. Of course. But also uh, supplements it with physical attacks. Is that always the case or only Michael Hamilton's build? 
Um, so I think uh, even before Uprising came out, when Icelander was a blitz only hero, mm -hmm. that was the uh, predominant strategy for Icelander. Okay. Uh, then I think when Uprising came out, a lot of people experimented with uh, magic only Icelander builds, mm -hmm. and Michael Hamilton really proved that no, still the best for Icelander is like a mix of physical attacks and magic backup. Okay. And I think that uh, I can understand why you might want to play some defense reactions in the matchup, mm -hmm. but Michael Hamilton had hit his opponent with a brain freeze a turn prior. Okay. Sees that his opponent has a sink below in their hand. Oh, so he knew that yeah. they had a... He okay. definitively knew. Okay. Uh, then the opponent... So I think it's okay to arsenal the sink below if your opponent doesn't know about it. Okay. But if your opponent knows about it, and he's Michael Hamilton, he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna figure out a strategy that punishes you. Then you're screwing yourself. Yeah. Basically. So I think... Okay. I think... Uh, I, I don't want to... I don't want to disparage the person who... Uh, put the sink below in, the, in in his arsenal. I think that against many other players, it would mm -hmm. have been a fine play. Okay, but Michael Hamilton basically just figured it out, and I, from what I was told, he hadn't like really like they'd never tested this before because it never occurred to them during testing that you would want to play sink belows in the mirror. Okay, they, they had tested the mirror a lot. Okay, but. So Michael Hamilton is basically like on the fly, like figuring out a strategy. So it's like Flesh and Blood is, is a lot of like a game of inches at times. Okay. But it's just like, you don't know exactly like if, if I don't attack with my attacks ever, like am I going to be able to do enough damage? Mm -hmm. So he's basically just like figuring it out. At, and it turns out that having your arsenal locked is just way more detrimental than never using, than an, never attack. using an attack. And um, that, that, okay, it was explained to me, the, the scenario was explained to me, but it was explained to me that that was a testament to how dominant Michael Hamilton's game sense is mm -hmm. in Flesh and Blood. So you, you agree with that? Or? Yeah, I think, I think the most impressive thing uh, is just his ability to kind of formulate the, like a, a strategy on the fly, not having enough, not having like the preparation for it, but still having the confidence in himself and the execution of of following through with the strategy at a high level. Yep. yep. So gotta give him kudos. He's the goat. So uh, that said, what about the rest? Did you have time to make any content? I did some stuff with Patreon members. I got to meet J Dubs. Got to grade some cards. Got to do some trades. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I met heard, other content creators. I heard a lot of booms over the weekend. Booms. Yep. Yep. Uh, Chris Sire's collab from yeah. the beginning to the end. Yeah. There was at a Fab lot. Unsealed. There was a lot of a lot of cool cards open. I think PCG had a uh, had a grading booth, so I know a lot of of uh, my friends kind of got their first taste of grading. Yep. Uh, at the event, uh, because it was so convenient, you get the little worlds label uh, on it on your slabs. Yeah, it's a nice label. So I'm waiting for some myself. <laughs> so I think that itself was also I think uh, a great step forward. I think to introduce. A lot more people into the graded uh, Flesh and Blood community. Yeah. Uh, at the event, I, I, I personally didn't get to make a lot of content. I was kind of swamped with, uh, with the preparation. But I think that uh, I did get to stay at the Equinox house, which are, they're kind of like... Um, uh, they're a group who's uh, run by two guys, uh, Boris and... Uh, or I think I usually call them Bilal. Okay. And... Uh, uh, Alex Keeler. Okay. And they run an operation, so they graciously invited me and some of uh, the people who uh, I was testing with to participate in this house. Uh, we were going to make some content, but due to some flight uh, delays, we weren't logistics able, issues. Yeah, yeah like we weren't able to make it on time, but I heard that uh, Ethan Van Sant was able to record uh, some videos there we they their i think their mission is to try to help enable uh players to be able to go to these tournaments to to be able to just like i guess like afford to be there okay and to to play the games to put them in positions where they can kind of like promote themselves uh on their platform as well as uh i think they make 
they, they're starting to try to make sleeves. They gave us some prototypes to test out, which is kind of cool. They're like, um, you know, like those like old, like ultra pro, like matte sleeves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not like the highest quality sleeves, but a good quality. And they're trying to market it at like a very affordable price. Okay. So are you saying this is kind of like a pro team that's also doing content creation to help them sustain their flesh and blood journey? I wouldn't say that they're a pro team. I think they're just like an organization trying to like find like these sponsors, like different sponsors to, to like help enable players who otherwise wouldn't be able to. Yeah, um, that's, that's really a struggle for players I hear. It's always that struggle of how do I make enough prize money and how do I sell my prize cards to continue that flesh and blood journey without having to go out of pocket too much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not everybody can be as lucky as, you know, the members of Team Dragon Shield. Mm -hmm. Those guys obviously deserve it and earned it. Um, but I hope that more and more of these organizations pop up or more and more, more and more of these arrangements pop up to support organizations like the one you mentioned. And you have a team too, right? Yes. Runaways. So, yes. Yeah. Um, Let's go Runaways. I got... I remember having the sticker. I don't have it with me anymore. We'll, we'll, we'll get a runaway sticker. We'll find one eventually. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, making, uh, we're making uh, myself, uh, Dan Rakowski, who got fourth at Worlds, Shane Brody, as well as a couple of other players that we tested with uh, for Worlds. I mean, it's, I think forming these organizations is basically just trying to build more of like uh like more communities more like uh ways for us to like help support each other of course yeah uh what else uh dynasty was released yeah it came out on the 11th yeah, right and we a couple days ago and we have uh we have some videos that we're gonna open dynasty we're gonna obviously. open some stuff but yeah. i wanted to like, kind of talk about one piece of dynasty news to close some of it has been positive some of it has been negative criticism of the fabled card okay I'm, I'm hearing the same thing but probably i'm getting different feedback but you first yeah so basically in a departure from what uh legend story studios has done in the past with regards to the fabled rarity yep they have uh made the fabled card in, in dynasty command and conquer and the reason why this is kind of a notable departure mm -hmm. is that this is the first time that the Fabled has been a reprint. That's true. And it's not a mechanically unique card. Yeah. And also, I think people are uh, ha who have negative criticisms uh, are complaining about the fact that they are kind of making a more desirable version of a card that they printed in a first edition set. Okay. But, I mean, if you want to stick to semantics, I believe the cold foil promise that James and LSS made was that they would never reprint a cold foil that had a cold foil, you know, rendition before. So Command & Conquer never had a cold foil rendition before. Oh, yeah. And yeah, Command & Conquer is also listed and, you know called by name in you know in relation to the emperor because it's part of the the emperor of Drakai's uh you know it's it's part of his mechanic yeah his so ability. It's definitely on theme and uh so they're printing it this is one time they're printing it as the cold foil because it's on theme for the set of dynasty and dynasty is also a supplementary set so i think that you know we've had enough um landmarks we have we've had enough gems and i even did a pcg commercial about it which you know featured a few episodes ago yeah. this is you know something new they're keeping us on our toes and this card is very desirable it's the nicest most pimp version of the card and i for one i want three or more copies of it i don't see a problem with it they made it very collectible it's you know on theme, it, it intertwines with the theme of the set, so I don't see a problem with it. I, You know, sure, James has mentioned that most of the time, when something gets reprinted and reprinted and reprinted, it comes out in an inferior, you know, manner. Like with, um, with Unlimited packs. and History Pack White Border. Yeah. Right? But 
this is one time where they just switched it up and I think it's absolutely appropriate. There's going to be, I, you know, I want a cold foil e-strike. I want a cold foil sink below. And as long as it makes sense, you know, let's, let's leave their design space open and not tell them what to do or what to print or be upset about what's out there. You don't, I mean, you don't like fabled command and conquer. Don't buy it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sell it. Right. I, I think, uh, I, I personally have a lot of positive feelings about their decision to print Command & Conquer as a fabled card uh, for a couple of reasons. In my opinion, the fabled rarity itself, at least how they've kind of handled the rarity in the past, mm -hmm. is somewhat of a failure. And what I mean by that is that this is supposed to be the highest rarity card in your set. Mm -hmm. But if you make it a mechanically unique card, you're hamstringing yourself in the context of game design. Okay. Because you cannot make this card a staple. We've seen, for example, Michael Hamilton is playing Heart of Findal yep. in his Icelander list. Heart of Findals are now, on TCG Play last I checked, $400. For the Rainbow Foil? For the Rainbow Foil Unlimited Edition version. Like three hundred fifty. Weren't they down to like one hundred, one twenty? Yeah, they, point? yeah, they were. And so basically, you have this like really high variance where you can have a card like Blood of Drakai, mm -hmm. which is just like not really playable. It's like fifty bucks right now. Yeah, it's like not playable anywhere. It's supposed to be the highest rarity card in your set, the most desirable card, mm -hmm. but it's very cheap because it's not. There's no real application for it, or if it ever does have an application then it's just going to be really expensive okay. because there aren't like a lot of them because they are the most rare cards. And I think when other games in the like Yu-Gi-Oh has done this in the past where they make their highest rarity cards uh when they when they print like their their staples like you, like their most powerful like cards like a must have at in super, the highest at rarity. super rarity. Yeah. It just like drives the price up mm -hmm. for no real reason. Okay. For the players. For the players. Yeah. So it's bad for the players. This is good for the players and good for the collectors because they didn't introduce a mechanically unique card. Mm -hmm. a gem Fabled, for example, yeah. that is only one in 40 boxes or less. Yeah. Right? And I think that the more people, even if players like who want to like pimp out their deck, who want to collect these, um, these CNC Fables, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's doing disservice to collectors. I think if anything, that's helping collectors by appreciating the value of their cards, right? I, I would say so. And not only that, I've heard James mention Command & Conquer multiple times as the most powerful in the card in the game, or at the very least, one of the most powerful cards in the game. Right. So the Emperor's ability, plus being in Dynasty, plus Command & Conquer being linked to the Emperor, and this set being the Emperor's set until he gets assassinated... <laughs> um, that makes it super appropriate. Yeah. And they're recognizing this card as one of the benchmarks within the game. This is like the gold standard of what a really disruptive card should be in Flesh and Blood. And they're not going to let you forget it because that is also a testament to how they're holding the line in terms of power creep. Because for a moment, we said a couple episodes ago that a race face was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread. And now a race face is kind of quasi meta only right oh the race face might be getting a lot better right now really yeah for for what reason uh i think dash is really strong right now and the race okay. face is very good against dash oh okay but um, well your results well, you know your mileage may vary but we'll command see. and conquer still has more applications over yeah we'll, we'll we'll see it we'll see it, uh how things shake out but i do think that if anything as a test Mm -hmm. I I have really good feelings about reserving uh, the highest rarity card for like high impact reprints mm -hmm. where it's like these are cards that people really like so they could do like E Strike they could do like whatever just like these are cards that are in the set yeah but it's just like a crazy version of it and if you love the art of the set if mm -hmm. you love uh, like having high rarity copies of cards in your deck like that is what it is for you. Yeah. Then collect it. If you don't like it, then sell it. I presumably 
have to assume yeah. like you like money, right? <laughs> you either like to collect the card, or you like money. So yeah, yeah. there you go. So I, I think overall it's a it's a it's a good step. Um, I wouldn't mind if they did gems or whatever in the future as like legendaries or something. Okay. I don't know. That that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Well, they just had that gem as a legendary, right? The oh, the, the Bolton one, the Bolton gem, yeah, right. So that's one example, and I think the Bolton one, the Bolton item is a little underwhelming and it's not very valuable. So I like Fabled Rarity being Fabled Rarity. I like Command and Conquer being in that Fabled Rarity because it doesn't do anything to dis dissuade me from wanting to collect. It actually encourages encourages me to have at least three copies mm -hmm. whereas you only need one you know cold full heart of find all one i have ophidia one arc knight shard right and one of the landmarks yeah. so this is a, a step in the right direction especially for a supplementary set but uh whenever their next main set is i fully expect them to roll out either a gem or landmark but leave this you know leave this gotcha uh, to, uh, you know, as a potential opening to keep us all on our toes. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's, is, is that about it for the month of uh, October and part of November? Yeah, I think the next month is probably going to be a little, a little bit quiet. A little quiet. We're in like the... We'll do a year-end wrap-up most likely. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Maybe, maybe yep. like instead of doing another like news, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up our feelings on 2022. 2022. We'll do a year in recap, but... Who knows? I mean, uh, 60 days ago, we didn't know Watsy was going to fall off a cliff. So, you know, in 60 days or in, in 45 days, you know, we might be in post-apocalyptic America and there might be zombies chasing us for our brains or something. Who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, All right, well until that time. Until then, bye for now, guys. I know it's a long episode, but just quick pickups from Worlds. Uh, shout out to LSS for making this playmat. Just wanted to feature this playmat. This was reward enough for uh, being a part of the calling, the sink below playmat. It's amazing, especially when you got the art right in front of your face. Um, this one, I have to give a special shout out to Ethan C. Ethan competed at Worlds and... Um, you know, he just heard that I really like playmats, and he came by, he just dropped the playmat um, basically on the table when I was sitting around chatting, and really appreciate him uh, giving me this copy of the playmat. I mean, other than buying it on the secondary market, there was no other way to get the playmat than to compete at Worlds, so appreciate you, Ethan. Also, last but not least, just a, a story about the, the friends made at Worlds, uh, or the friendships uh, made at Worlds. Um, I saw Newson Zhang at Worlds, and Newson watches Fabled Hunters, so thank you so much, Newson. Um, he had in his hand um, a test print Dorinthia Iron Song, as well as a cold foil Dorinthia, uh, signed by Lius Lasahito. And I was like, you know, uh, Newson only had one copy of each, and I was like, um, what, what, do you, what do you plan to do with those, man? And he's like, well, I only have you know, this copy for me, and, um, I don't know, he just, I, di I didn't have to give him the sad, droopy, puppy dog face, but he's just like, oh, Saint, you're, like, Dorinthia's biggest fan, right? And I'm like, am I? Am I? And he just literally, like, yeah, here you go, man. Uh, so, really, really appreciate you, Newson. Um, he's got a heart of gold. He's not only good for shredding tunics, he's an amazing guy. Thanks, guys.